Hello there viewers, we sat down with Ivan Krastev, the political analyst in Vienna, in order to talk about the recent victory of the Austrian Freedom Party and its possible impact on Austria, on Hungary and on Europe as well. We also talked about the rise of the far-right parties in Europe, the possible outcome of the American presidential election and its impact on the European and the global economy. And we have touched many other issues as well. Please consider to subscribe if you are new to our channel and let's roll. Hello, Ivan Krastev. Thank you to accept our invitation for the second time. It's really a prestige and an honor. Pleasure. So let's start to talk about uh, the rise of the Austrian far right because the Freedom Party won uh, the European Parliament election in June and now they won the national election just a week ago. So. A lot of people talked about urbanization as a threat on the Austrian society. Do you see this as a real danger? Listen, uh, uh, if we're talking about the control over power that you see in Hungary compared to his Austria, this is not possible. Don't forget that uh, when Mr. Orban won the elections, he won the constitutional majority that allows him basically to remake the political system, which is not the case here. Secondly, the far right in Austria is not a new phenomenon. In a certain way, this was one of the first uh, parties on the right of the conservatives that really went up in the European politics. You remember Haider. Uh, yeah. So here, this is kind of a, the new right is not so new. Uh, they have been in government uh, several times with, uh, uh, with the center right. So. This, from this point of view, this you don't have the shock of something that was always out of power, which was a talk about Le Pen or some other countries in which this has not happened. Uh, the news is that they are winning and they have a leader who basically is very much insisting that he's going to be the major figure in the Austrian political life. They did well. They didn't do exceptionally well. And one of the reasons is that uh, the center-right uh, performed quite strongly. There was possibilities that uh, basically far right is going to do much better. There are two major issues behind their success, and this is not new if you compare it to most of the countries. Uh, one is migration, and this was traditionally an issue, but of course for the far right here, it was not so easy because during uh, Kurtz period, uh, the conservatives were also quite <coughs> tough on migration. But don't forget, Austria is a country with a very high number of migrants per person. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, for the last two or three years, there was a major increase. So there is not only talk. The second is COVID. Still. And this is something that people don't realize to what extent uh, basically the pandemic has remade um, the nature of political loyalties. Uh, Austria, in general, if you're going to see the figures, uh, didn't do badly during the COVID. But there were two things about Austria that were very specific. One is that probably this is the country with the longest lockdown periods. And secondly, they have an obligatory vaccination. And this created a certain level of resentment in certain parts of the population. And because uh, the far right took a very strong anti-vaccine and anti-lockdown policies, I do believe that they managed to recruit particularly younger people, particularly from type of a milieu that was not necessarily their traditional voters. And this was seen first in the regional elections in rural Austria, and I do believe it is seen now. So this kind of a coalition of people who are very much worried about migration and basically people who are very much kind of resentful towards what the government did during COVID, it was expensive, it was too long and so on, uh, is something that really allowed uh, the far right uh, to win. My son is uh, uh, studying here in a school in Austria. And the Austrian schools, before the elections, they always invite the panel from the representatives of the major party to discuss with the students. Wow. Uh, and it was, it was great. So you have 200 kids staying in this uh, Sorry, is it school. allowed in Austria to have political parties coming to the schools and yeah, having a debate it, it, in front together, of the kids? Yeah, but they, they are all uh, parliamentary representative parties. And not simply that it is allowed, it's encouraged. And the kids were going there and they were very much interested because, don't forget, I do believe here they start voting at 16. 
Uh, uh, so there was really a kind of a huge interest. And then the representative of, uh, of the Freedom Party, he said, we are pushing for ethnic homogeneity. And then one of the students said, I have a question, but my question is not to the panel. My question is to the audience. Please, those of you who have a migra migrant background, to raise their hand. And there was 90, 95% of the students, because particularly uh, the migrants' figures are very high uh, for people who are younger uh, than 21. So uh, from this point of view, this is something that is very important in order to understand the support, but also the constraints of the far right. Uh, listen, in a way, people voting for the far right are also migrants. Uh, but they want to migrate not in space, but in time. And they want to migrate back to the Austria that they remember. The Austria that was different ethnically, the Austria that basically they believe that they understand and that they believe that they were understood. And the only way to migrate in time and not in uh, space is by ballots. Uh, you can cross physical borders, walking or driving or flying, but the only way to fly either to the future or the past is by ballot. So you're practically saying that the Freedom Party is a strong but a dying political project. I'm not going to say dying. Listen, who is living and who is dying is difficult. They're at the moment basically capturing certain type of a sentiment which is genuine and this is the society is changing very fast. Hmm. And we should be fair to the people because it's easy to go for all this 30% and to believe this is the same person and everything that is driving them is xenophobia and so on. But we're living in the world that is really changing very fast. And particularly for certain people, uh, this is becoming a really traumatic experience. Hmm. Uh, and they have the feeling that they have lost the idea of home. Uh, they don't understand much what is happening in their own society. So they're protesting in the way they do. Uh, some of them probably even don't believe that you can go back where they want to do, but they want to signal their displeasure, be it with the uh, rise of migration, being with the way uh, they believe that the government was uh, treating them and tried to surveying them uh, during uh, COVID. And all these people had the feeling that nobody's hearing them. And here comes uh, the Freedom Party. Hungary's Prime Minister Orban expressed great interest in getting Mr. Kikil as the next Chancellor of Austria. And prior to that, he already uh, made huge bets on, um, on Mr. M Ms. Meloni in Italy. But that project didn't turn out good for him. Do you think that uh, Mr. Orban, um, let's say, could not rely as much on Mr. Kikil if he get elected as a Chancellor? Listen. Difficult, uh, 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 difficult to tell. But what is interesting, I was uh, very carefully reading uh, uh, the, the speech that Mr. Orban had in July when he was talking in Transylvania on the Summer Academy. And in my view, this was kind of a very honest speech uh, in which he laid very clearly his uh, view for the future of Europe and particularly the Hungarian strategy for it. Because this explains why Kiki is so important for him. Of what I read in this is that first, he believes that the West is in decline, the East and particularly China is up. So in this situation, strongly and paradoxically, contrary to many who believe that Mr. Orban uh, very much will go for a strong relations with the United States if uh, uh, Mr. Trump is, related, uh, is elected, his position is that I like Trump exactly because he's not interested in Europe too much. And he's going to allow Europe to be much more autonomous, particularly in some of economic policies. From this point of view, interestingly enough, he's not so different than Macron. He's in fact pushing for decoupling from the United States, even if Trump comes to power. Because he believes that the role of Hungary is to be the gateway through which Chinese interests are going to be represented in Europe. So of what I saw, basically he's betting on China. Hmm. Uh, and from this point of view, when you're betting in China, uh, you basically try to see what kind of a coalition you can create uh, in order to be sure that no further political integration is possible, that you're not going to be basically on your own. And here his bet is very much on uh, several countries, most of them from the former Habsburg Empire. Slovakia, Czech Republic, Austria. He believes that if elections in these countries go well, he can be a leader of this bloc because the problem with Mrs. Meloni is that 
they have probably many things in common, but there are one thing that divides them dramatically, and this is who is going to be the leader uh, uh, of the new uh, right and what is the policy of this right. And from this point of view, Italian interest and the Hungarian interest does not go easily together. Uh, and he's trying to get a coalition, which is not the old Visegrad, because Poland, even if they're going to be a conservative government, is never going to change their view on Russia. They're always going to see their interests because of security, closer to Scandinavians. So we think major regrouping, and from this point of view, he sees much more the former Habsburg countries, and if one day the Western Balkans are going to be in uh, European Union as the natural allies. Uh, so, but on the other side, he's extremely active. Uh, he's extremely active in uh, kind of supporting uh, political allies uh, all over Europe. Uh, there was a publication uh, somewhere that it was a Hungarian bank that had been giving loans to Vox in Spain. Yes. So from this point of view, he's really trying to create the networks of a friendly parties and friendly leaders. For more than a decade, the rise of the far right was a very common narrative among European nations, European countries. And you can name the, the recent win of victory of the Freedom Party, or you can say that there was this strong showing of uh, AFD in Eastern German provinces, uh, Marine Le Pen's victory uh, in France, uh, or Gerd Wilders getting the first place in the Dutch elections. So is there a general pattern among all of these far-right parties? No, listen, for sure. And part of it is very much the strength of the far right comes from the sense of demographic anxieties. We are living in a societies which are aging, which are shrinking in demographic terms, uh, and where basically there is a lot of uh, change in the ethnic composition of societies. Hmm. It's everywhere. Italy is a dramatic case, but France is a dramatic case. So from this point of view, it's not simply migration. It's a demographic imagination. Suddenly you imagine society in which 40% are going to come from Africa, where your society even almost can disappear in 30 or 40 years. Because one of the things that has happened to our idea of the future is future is not a project anymore, it's a projections. And particularly demographic projections. And one of the things that is happening in many parts of the world, it's not only Europe, this is China, this is many others, is that you have a very low birth rates. Basically, in the half of the countries in the world, the birth rate is below the, below the reproduction yep. level. And this creates this kind of a panic. And while, for example, on the left, particularly on the climate left, the story is that we're the last man because they're not going to be life on Earth. Uh, on the right, the fear is that I'm the last Bulgarian, the last Hungarian, uh, basically the last French, because either our identity is going to be mixed in the way I cannot recognize it anymore, or simply I'm going to disappear. I assume you are familiar with this uh, public argument that claims that migration is in fact a kind of a proxy to other social problem, problems like housing or, prop, or poverty. So, so, so do you agree with this argument or how would you explain the relevance of this topic in contemporary European politics? I do believe it's really more deeper because we try to reduce every problem to economic problem. But there is this existential uncertainty. The way we live has changed. And listen, change very fast, very quickly. So as a result of it, basically, you have this kind of identity in crisis everywhere you go. Personal identities, but also national identities and others. And migration, of course, is one of the issues which exists. Uh, the interesting with the far right, and this is really interesting, is that normally you have governments that are uh, basically elected on anti-migrant ticket, but when they come to power, the number of migrants coming are not decreasing. For example, Meloni is a classical example. Uh, the number of the migrants, legal and illegal, who entered Italy after Meloni came to power, has increased. But people are not, in a certain way, punishing her for this. Her voters continue to vote for her, and as you know, she did very well on the European elections. Why? Because they believe, because it's very important, people are confused. 
it's very, we always try to imagine that in the heads of the people, they're very clear ideas, they're very consistent. But people are very confused. On one level, they really don't want so many foreigners in their countries. But on the other side, they want somebody to take care of their old parents. And the people who are going to take care of their yeah, old parents are foreigners. Uh, so all these two things are at the head of the person at the same time. Uh, what they like about Meloni is not the fact that she's going to reduce uh, basically immigrants, but the fact that she does not like the fact that the Italian society is becoming more diverse. But on the other side, they don't want her to take neither the cleaning lady out of their houses, uh, not the person who is taking care of the old, uh, 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 of the old mother and father they're taking uh, around. So as a result of it, it's very important because the impact of migration policies are asymmetrical. So one level, basically, uh, far right is rewarded for being tough in the rhetoric, but this is not punished when they don't succeed. Uh, well, funnily enough, for the Greens, this is the opposite. To be honest, Ger German Greens, for many reasons, some of them structural, managed to reduce quite a lot the carbon imprint. Uh, but they're not uh, rewarded for this. Uh, on the other side, they're very much punished for rhetoric, which is perceived as too <laughs> radical. And I do believe that this is interesting because I do believe these two groups, far right and on a certain way, uh, the climate left have been very much structuring the elections, particularly when it comes on a uh, level. And then, of course, you have the economic issues, and they are very clear. Uh, you have housing, particularly problem for the young. Part of the housing problems comes from policies which otherwise you're going to see as beneficial. For example, Netherlands is the greatest example of this. Too many students or too much Airbnb. Uh, when the Airbnb came, everybody was happy. People can have an additional income and so on. But it started changing the cities. Yeah. So it's not one thing. And by the way, to believe that all these parties, quite often they talk in a similar way. But what drives their policies and what drives their support is quite different. Uh, in a certain way, there is nothing more local than a local far-right party. At the beginning of the year, at the European Council of Foreign Relations, you collectively published an analysis that identified five uh, different uh, crises, the pandemic, climate change, economic insecurity, immigration, and the war in Ukraine, uh, that primarily concerns the European citizens. Uh, Do you think the mission statement and planned composition of the new European Commission, uh, I don't know, reflect on the relevance of these issues? Listen, Europe is important, but don't forget that Europe is spending 1% of the GDP of the, of the European continent. The biggest money still stay with the national governments. And from this point of view, also the national governments is the one that you can follow differently because you speak the language. If you're an ordinary Bulgarian, ordinary Hungarian, it's not so easy. Not because you cannot find a translation of these documents or other documents, but because uh, you're just following things which either upset you or that interest you very much. Of course, European uh, Commission becomes much more important in areas in which before it was not uh, touching to after COVID. Before COVID, the health policy nothing to do with Brussels. Then came COVID and Brussels decided to buy vaccines together in order to, to have a lower prices. Now with the war in Ukraine, the biggest question is, are we going to end up with a European scale and European sized defense sector? And this is interesting because in a certain way, one of the things that we see from the beginning of the war is that Russia was much more capable to mobilize its economy to work on a war terms. Uh, but then the story is who is doing this. And interestingly enough, what is happening is also changing the position of the companies. You can see it, some of the big uh, defense companies like Ryan Metal and others going to places like Hungary yeah, absolutely. or Bulgaria. South Africa. Right? And yeah, and India. so on. So from this point of view, the European Union is great at giving incentives for certain things. And also there is one thing that governments cannot do at all. And this is basically regulating big players coming from outside, for example. Can you believe that Bulgaria on its own can regulate Google 
uh, or Twitter or anybody else. So that's where the European Commission has some relevance. Yeah, and they have a relevance. And this is the stories, and this is very interesting. From this point of view, this was interesting, really, to see the Macron-Orban difference, because both of them believe that Europe should be autonomous space. Europe should have a policy in certain areas different than the United States and so on. But in the case of Orban, uh, uh, the case of uh, Macron, the idea is we should create European champions. We should yeah. create companies to compete with Americans and to compete with Chinese. In the case of Orban, we should have it in order to be able to allow the Chinese to get in. And this is what we are doing. So from this point of view, you have this kind of a Everybody has the feeling that something is changing, but what should be European response? And it very much depends on history. It becomes on size and also on political imagination. Okay, but if the European Commission doesn't have the economic impact on the European Union, but it has the impact on regulations within the European Union, then what does this new formulation of the European Commission uh, says to you? in regards to these uh, five key crises which you mentioned in your analysis? No, listen, they made, from this point, the European Commission is, of course, going into the direction in which Macron was going. And the idea was, if you want to be a power, we should end up with European champions. What it means is that we should change the competition uh, uh, Lows because till now uh, all the competition commissioner was doing was to be sure that the big European companies are not going to emerge because they're going to make it very difficult mm -hmm. for the small European companies to strive. And so now the story is if they're not going to be a big European companies, we are never going to be able to compete outside of Europe. So we are going to be in a very bad situation. So probably if it is today, you're going to see emerges that have been banned 10 years ago. Is it good or bad? I don't know. But this is basically the, uh, the trend which you have. Secondly, capital market. Basically, European pension funds invest more than 90% of their money in the United States market. Why? Mm. Because basically, European capital market is very weak. Uh, and as a result of it, basically, Draghi said, if you want to do something, you need a European capital market. Uh, at the same time, it means that the national state is going to lose quite a lot of, basically, its own instruments to control, to do this, to do that. And uh, as a result of it, also, it comes to uh, sectors like telecoms. Uh, if I remember it rightly, uh, it, at average, European telecoms has around 8 uh, million customers. In the United States, it's, for example, Hamgrid in China is 200. Can you imagine how much money, how, what is the difference when it comes to re research and development? Mm. How much more money the bigger companies, be American, be Chinese, can do? And this is important because what is happening on the level of the European Union is we have been betting on certain things that did not turn exactly how we expected. One is that there were not going to be a war. One of the success of the European Union is that uh, basically it was so successful that make Europeans unable to think about war. This great success turned to be the biggest vulnerability when the way, the, basically the war came uh, to the European continent. Uh, the second story was uh, quite smartly, uh, uh, high European uh, senior bureaucrats and political leaders said, okay, we don't have Google, we don't have Alibaba, but then, because of this, we can be the regulator of the global market, exactly because we don't have our champions. And this was a solid proposition. And it was valid till the moment the American and the Chinese market starts to decouple violently. They have been totally securitized. Americans said, we're not going to export certain things to China, Chinese to the United States. Both of them start to talk about technology and security terms. And then you should be either in the American technological sphere where Europe is going to be, or in the Chinese, but then whom you're regulating exactly. Hmm. Are the Americans going to allow to regulate them? No, probably on a global level, they can be living with this, but not in this new world. And this adjusting to a new world is not easy because European Union was one of the biggest beneficiaries of the last three decades. And when you're a big beneficiary of something in the moment of change, you're very vulnerable. In the case of war, in my view, we're very much in a position. There was this old movie. Do you remember being there for this uh, great gardener 
who he spent most of his life just doing the garden and watching the television. So when he was basically attacked on the street, the only thing that he did is he took his remote control and tried to change the channel. So from time to time, we had such a peaceful and nice life for a long period of time. And now in this kind of a much more violent development in the last uh, years, the European Union is forced to rethink major strategies. And this is what basically von der Leyen is uh, going to be forced to do. You've briefly mentioned the drug report and I'd like to ask you to expand on it because the former chief of the European Central Bank uh, just recently published his much awaited uh, analysis of the on, on EU competitiveness. And uh, the report calls for much higher levels of investment in economy and for a much more integrated European Union. But the first was blocked by uh, the Germans' attachment to fiscal discipline, while the latter by the visible rise of parties opposing further integration. So what are the prospects for the emergence of a political coalition capable of carrying out the necessary steps um, despite these oppositions? Listen, it's not going to be easy, but on the other side, the major decision to be taken, and this is on many respects, is going to be also a German decision. Are you going to allow much higher borrowing for the European Union, which means are you going to allow industrial policy on the level of the European Union, or you're just going to do and try to have an industrial policy on the level of Germany? Before, the idea was that we don't need industrial policies. It was a much more open market. We were trying to be competitive. Mm. But now both Chinese and Americans and everybody else is becoming much more protectionist. And if Trump is elected, we're going to have a tariffs for the Chinese, but they're going to be also tariffs for the Europeans. And then what we're going to do? Uh, are we going to put the tariffs of our own? By the way, some of the green uh, kind of a things that we have been discussing, basically making a much higher prices for countries which are producing not in a clean way, seen from outside were perceived also basically as our green coward protectionism. Uh, but this is a major issue. It comes Draghi and said, listen, the only thing that can make us competitive is scale. We're still a very big market, 450 million. And if we're basically going to allow to have a European capital market, if we're going to allow basically for this industrialization, this is critically important. But here comes national politics, and I'm going to give you an example. Volkswagen, as you know now, is starting cutting a lot of jobs. So the worst performing factories are in Germany, because the labor force is more expensive, because they went to produce models, which was much more EVs, and now the Chinese EVs on a better price is basically uh, overperforming the Germans. Uh, and their better, best performing are in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, in Hungary. So if you follow the totally market logic, you should close your factories in Germany and you can continue with your factories in Central and Eastern yeah. Europe. But listen, you're a German company. And the German chancellor, the last thing that he wants is to see 10,000 workers being cut and the company being closed. And many of these companies, basically, the whole town can depend on them and the jobs that they exist. So here, the clash between the national politics and the European networks, the European supply chains, the global supply chains are becoming critically important. And this is the decisions to be taken. And none of this decision is going to be easy because if the German government is going to put pressure on German companies to keep their German operation, if they're going to push them, if should cut, cut somewhere else, uh, we're in a different game. And this is why the state is coming back in the economy in the way it was not in the European Union before. This is why the idea of the state aid is coming back because in a normal European market, state aid was to be banned. And now you have a much more hidden forms of a state aid everywhere. Okay, so the Germans are not in favor of the drug report, but do you see any other, I don't know, national or even pan-European movements, political forces, yeah. which could be leading forces of such a transformation? Spain today declared that they're going to look basically for three or four countries uh, with which they can start this harmonization on the capital market. Mm -hmm. And I do believe this is the future of the European Union. They're going to be a different coalition according to different issues. For example, I can easily see on the defense industry 
the Baltics, the Scandinavians, the Poles and others to try to integrate their kind of defense sectors much more than the others. And then there are going to be countries which are going to lead much more on the banking and the capital markets and so on. So you're going to have kind of a too many avant-garde groups. Based too many on, avant-garde groups. Yeah, based on very much... Uh, Uh, what is uh, predominantly most important for the countries. And here the story is like with any type of offensive uh, politics to be sure that uh, your back is well protected. (laughs) Okay, let's turn to China because China constitutes another big anxiety for the European elites. Uh, And I think it reveals that how uh, fragile is the consensus Um, among European nations towards the China. So, for example, uh, when it comes to the EV industry, France is strongly in favor of protective tariffs. Germany and Spain are against. Hungary is attracting giant investments from China, and not just for the battery factories, but also for, for EV cars uh, by the BID and other companies. So, do you see any coherent strategy uh, emerging vis-a-vis China? No, there is, not, uh, uh, there is not such a strategy because the countries has totally different relations with China. Basically for Germany, this is the biggest market. Germany is trading with China more than with its European neighbors. Mm-hmm. So Bulgaria, for us there is no China. <laughs> They are not really important in our economic policies. In the case of Hungary, this is a bet. Basically, Orban bet it on China. And this is important because the problem of China is that they have a lot of overcapacity and they're trying to basically sell these very big amounts that they're producing. And for them, the only thing that matters is a market share. And this is why they're subsidizing quite a lot. For example, their EV cars are two or two and a half times cheaper than most of the American and uh, German products. Uh, but then, of course, comes the story that uh, technologically, Europe is very much dependent on the United States. And if the United States basically pushes for much more a hostile politics with respect to China, if they said, if you're going to do this, we're not going to give you that, this is going to be very difficult for the European industry because on one level, uh, European uh, uh, American relations on the level of trade and investment are very well developed. On the other, China is still a big market. Uh, and this is interesting, but the tariffs has also their dark side, not simply because they're making some of the products more expensive, but imagine, um, for example, Donald Trump and then Biden continue this, put a very high tariffs on some of the Chinese goods if they're coming from China. Yeah. So what the Chinese are doing, they're opening uh, a, a factories in Mexico. So what is before a China product is becoming a Mexican product. But as a result of it, the number of Chinese goods de facto entering in America has not been decreased, but Chinese influence has increased. Because now having these factories in Mexico, of course, the influence on Mexican politics is much higher than it was before. So strangely, the side effect of this tariff policy is that we are making China much more of a global player than it was before. Hmm. Uh, and we're going to see this type of a lot of unintended consequences on everything. On the other side, obviously, the Chinese are securitizing a lot. They make it very difficult for Europe uh, on many areas. Uh, you are seeing this with the rare materials and others. And here comes the other story. Uh, in our own view, the fact that Europeans, we have a much more environmentally sensitive citizens and others is going to allow us to have higher standards, and this is going to be our strengths. But now comes the moment in which, for example, there is lithium in Europe. So we do not need to rely on Chinese and others. But how to basically produce it? Because mining in Europe or in the United States is very difficult. Uh, People, particularly from the regions where the mining should take place, don't want to do it. Before, it was much easier to take people, you're going to get a lot of money. But now they said money is not everything. And this is so much changing reality. So in a certain way, I really insist that the most important today is to understand how fast the world is changing. And from time to time, we simply are not fast enough to understand what is happening to us. (laughs) But from the EU's perspective, what would be a realistic strategy towards uh, China? Uh, On one hand, there is the, the example of Hungary, 
which is trying to balance between the two superpowers, between China and the US, or uh, Europe should join to uh, the US's new Cold War uh, towards the China. So well, listen, European Union, the best theoretically from the European Union is to try to have a kind of a autonomous policy of its own, but this to be a common policy. Uh, the interesting in the bed of uh, 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 your prime minister is that he believes that because of his very good personal relations with Mr. Trump, he can balance in neutralized, very China aggressive policy of the next Trump administration. But the story is going to be they're going to be pushed on tariffs. Yep. And then this push is going to be done by the European Commission as a whole. And then basically is Hungary ready to veto? and how then the Americans are going to view this. And, uh, and this is really interesting because for the Americans, uh, all this tariff policy makes sense if they're going to push their allies to join. Just doing this on the level of the United States uh, is not going to help. And I'm going to tell you why, because of course, the American market is very big, but you can stop Chinese only if Europe is going to basically close their market, Australia, Japan, and others. So from this point of view, it's going to be really a difficult negotiations. Europe has an interest to have an its own China policy, but only to the extent it's going to be a common policy. If basically all different European countries start to play games of their own, uh, this is going much more to fragment the European Union than strengthening it. Okay, so tariffs and let's say economic competition between the EU and the US are one source of anxiety of European For elites. Sure. Sure. But, but the other one is, I think, the possible outcome of the next presidential election and its impact on the war in Ukraine. So do you see that in these dimensions would be any major difference between a possible new term of Donald Trump or a possible first term of Kamala Harris? No, listen, the truth is that both of them, uh, there is a kind of a general feeling that the war should end, if possible, next year. The problem is that nobody knows how to end it. Uh, and one level is Trump, who said, I'm coming and I'm going to end it in 48 hours. It sounds great on one level, and people probably, uh, some are going to vote for him of saying this. Uh, the, the story is where the Russians in this, because you cannot basically just end the war by stopping Ukrainians fighting, because it's not the end of the war, it's the end of Ukraine. Uh, and Trump probably is also not keen on this. He believes that his star power is going to come and basically Putin is going to agree and he's going to give to Putin certain things that he believes that they're important to Putin. The story is that there is one thing that is important to Putin and uh, Trump cannot give him. Namely, Putin does not want American president to be perceived as the great peacemaker. Because his war is not only about Ukraine, it's about the West. And even Donald Trump is part of this West. So I'm not going to be surprised if Trump comes, he comes with certain peace initiative and the Russians do not respond. And then the problem is what is going to come next. And some of the Ukrainians uh, believe that probably Trump is ready to be more ready to give them what Biden is not giving them. I don't know. And then Harris. Well, Harris stands closer to where Biden is. But on the other side, uh, the major fear on the, uh, on the Western side is first that demographically Ukraine is in a very difficult position. And this is something that basically people are not realizing. Both Russia and Ukraine are going to end up as losers to the extent that this was a country's with a diminishing population and so on, which went through a very tough war. One million is the number of people being killed and wounded till now, when you go both sides. And also in both sides, you have migration. Uh, uh, you have basically babies not born. And the story is how many people you can lose without losing your future. Uh, but on the other side, it's also very difficult for this war to end because basically, Russia will want certain things that should be not given to it. And for the Ukrainians, any type of a compromise has a very high political price because uh, Ukrainian society was not prepared and nobody basically has really convinced them what is the meaning of sovereignty if they're going to lose certain territory. So you see very little potential for de-escalation? I do believe everybody talks, we want to escalate after that in order to de-escalate and to go to negotiations. But the story is that for the Russians at the moment, it's much easier to escalate and they're doing this. 
they have destroyed 70% of the energy infrastructure of uh, uh, Ukraine, which is big. And they basically believe that they're not going to freeze the conflict, they're going to freeze Ukrainians. I know it was an exhausting interview, but thank you very much for your time and thank you for the chance. Thank you for the invitation.